it's the hard side of, of, of any business, especially as, as businesses grow. Hello, everyone. Welcome into Tech Stacks Rewind. I think Nick's probably going to leave that ugly part no, that I, think I started you need with. No, I to keep it in. Like, it has, it has to stay. You know, sometimes when you drink cold water, it affects your tongue. Okay, don't make any jokes, Nick. But that's what happened here. So I apologize for the rewind. Ethan Jones does our stats, right? And you, you compared the last four national champions to A&M's offense, their pitching, and we did that on the show. But now you're going to give us a look at the wins and losses between those. Yeah, let's do it real quick. Um, so let's look at the SEC win percentage. A&M's this season has been a 72.2. The average of the SEC, or the or they're all SEC teams, but the national champions of the last four years, sixty-two are sixty-four point two. Um, the top twenty-five win percent percentage, A and M seventy-three point seven. The champions fifty-six point seven. Um, and then away neutral games win percentage seventy-one point four, and then seventy-one point one for the champions. I may give you a project to then compare teams that win at A and M's clip and how they've done in the last few years as opposed to because what you're saying is we need to lose more is that what you're saying ethan not, not necessarily not necessarily one reason why these are lower is because old miss won in 2022 and they didn't they had they brought like the a, number down so if you like take them out the numbers lift up to pretty similar okay. with the other three and old miss remember almost didn't make the, yeah. the tournament so and they won it all callie gardner hello how are you hey i'm good hey uh busy show like that nine o'clock hour it was a little stressful was it not it was it was crazy but it was fun what for me. Would, for you, you just you barely got to talk because we were just talking to people left and right. Favorite part of the show? Um, I, I enjoyed it all. I really liked Kendall Rogers. I loved having Trisha Ford and Amanda Scarborough in the same segment. Got to meet Trisha's daughter. She's really fun. Uh, Emma Ford is her name. That's just, I feel like that's such a very... That's a like, good name. Yeah. Quality like, name right quality there. Quality name. Um, but yeah, I think I think Trisha and Amanda was my favorite part for sure. Well, I'm going to try to keep my job and say Billy Lucci was my favorite part of the show. <laughs> he joined us for a long time during the go hour that bled into the nine o'clock hour. That's how we roll. A lot of changes across the street. We talked about that. The transfer portal, you name it. Recruiting country with Ryan Broniger, that and more. It is the Rewind. Tough day for athletics yesterday and, and some of your dear friends. Uh, <laughs> Just uh, just yeah. rough. But something I think Trev Albers alluded to at his opening day press conference. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the hard side of any. It, well, I said you want to say college athletics, and that's been kind of something we've all said in the last twenty four hours or so. But it's the hard side of of, of any business, especially as as businesses grow. Um, you know, I'm not grow. Not that A and M athletics is growing, but just at, the bigger you get in terms of business, kind of the more, you know, almost like you want to say, unemotional it feels. The problem is for for the people that lost their jobs mm -hmm. yesterday and had their jobs cut. That there's a lot of emotion involved. I think there is for Trev Albert. You know, he comes in. He comes in new and is kind of tasked with, hey, we're going to make this thing leaner and, and more profitable or less unprofitable. You know, they're, they're operating in this massive deficit. And he said, like you said, during the presser, if you just listened, you knew mm -hmm. that was coming. And, and it's going to come all over the country. You're going to start to see this happen because – what's coming down the road and he talked openly about that that day too it's just i don't know if it's a year or 18 months i don't even think it's going to be that long you're going to see revenue share model particularly with the big 10 and the sec and then in some degree all of college football is going to have to go to it and you're talking about a 15 20 25 million dollar expense to the money that the revenue, it, I mean, it'll go up like it always does in college football, but that expense is coming out of nowhere. That's not coming with, hey, we're going to spend all this money, but it's going to make us more. No, that's just coming out of what you make. Um, and I think he just looked at kind of the organization and saw, I think in some instances, it's probably a lot of these sport administrator type duties he's looking at and I don't know this for sure, but thinking he's going to be a sport administrator for these sports as an AD that doesn't have to fundraise because of the 12th man. So there was looks like that put into it, but it doesn't change the fact that the, the reality of it is a lot of you know good people got let go. Winning teams win at home, and they, they hold serve there, right, Amanda? 
Yeah. I mean, I don't know what it is. Have you guys been able to, to put your finger coach on <laughs> what it is about this team playing at home? Because I mean, the home runs in the offense is like what sticks out to me at home. I don't know if it's getting excited for some bubbles that are going to be flowing when they score, or maybe a cannon shot from the cannon that showed up in that game against Kentucky. Like they're just extra motivated to put runs on the board, which is awesome at home. Then pitchers and defense have to love it. Yes. It's the 12th man. Let's yeah. Everything that Amanda just described all comes back to the 12th man. Yeah. Well, but also laser focus from your team. I mean, that, yeah. and that plays a part in the way they do their pregame warmups, the, the meetings beforehand that all plays a role. Yeah. They, they're starting to get it. And that's all like, you know, um, our seniors have totally bought in and are bringing everybody along. But you, when you have players that have played at a high level, have gone to supers, have gone to the World Series, you know, Julia Cottrell has gone to all of those, you know, places. They understand what it looks like, especially at the end of year. Last night was a, you know, I think I was texting uh, quite a bit yesterday of like, this game is, you know, it's going to be a tough one. And I thought if we didn't come out focused, it was going to be a hard game. And I thought we just did a really good job of coming out and playing our game. Amanda, talk about Coco and what you've seen from her this season and just uh, continually just being a, a dominant force out there. Yeah, I thought she looked hungrier last night. You know, she's had a couple of injuries or times this year where she's missed games. And it just seems like when she comes back, she's even more hungry to get out there. I mean, the plays that she made on defense, Trish, and then just her at bats, like her aggressiveness in the box yesterday, it looked like a player that hadn't even played all year and was just itching to get out there. So um, I don't love it when she's not out there, you know, of course, like not in the everyday lineup, but. But the good part about it is that it seems like when she gets back out there, she's even better than she was before. It's Sam Brown, it, but it only ratchets up the must-get factor for Sam Brown even more now uh, if you're going to lose out on Lambert Smith. And uh, when you look at what he's done in his career at U of H, it's hard to ignore and like hard to not go. If if Aiden lands this kid, he is an immediate impact player. Um, in a wide receiver core that I think A needs some help in terms of depth, but B also needs another down the field, big play catch and run threat. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So uh, this would be massive if they're able to, and it's an official visit, so he's going to have 48 hours, and he's going to they're going to roll out the red carpet for him, and um, it would be a massive get for for Texas A&M if they're able to land him. And you just wonder about. He's not originally from Texas. I think he's from Georgia. He started his career at West Virginia. Uh, you know, this the modern recruit now uh, out of the portal, like getting their entire story correct. It's it's hard to even memorize because you know, West Virginia, it, you know, Houston to may, did, maybe A and M, but right. he's originally from Georgia. I think so. Just tracking the entire yeah. movement, but um, yeah, and when. Uh, what I like it, for a and chances is obviously he's got familiarity with the state of Texas and he's not moving his entire life across the country, but I don't know that that matters. Like we said, within his path was Georgia to West Virginia to Houston. Does it matter that College Station's 90 miles away? And, right. But what I'm excited about, what gives me hope that a can get this done is what they have done so far in the spring transfer portal window. When you look at how quickly things have come about and – been shut down in favor of A&M with Josh Ellisgar, with Shane Calhoun, with Solomon DeShields, with Coley. Have you tried to pronounce that last name? Coley? Coley oh, Nugu, you're talking about the yeah. center. From, I, I've, I've just used the nickname. Okay, you still call him Coley? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I want to make sure, he, I want to hear him pronounce it or somebody else pronounce it before we butcher it. I mean, I, I you know, going back to a and I, I, I like the remaining schedule. I mean, I think, they, I think the winner series against Ole Miss I think LSU, even though LSU is desperate, I think A&M is way better on the mound than LSU is right now. I also just think they're a way better, like a much better offense. So I, I like that matchup for A&M. And, of course, any, anytime you get Arkansas at home, uh, you're in good shape. But I, I'll say this. You know, it's interesting when you look at the top eight seeds, and we'll have our latest projections out later today. But when you look at the top eight seeds, like I really feel like if A&M wins that series this weekend, and, and fr frankly the same kind of goes for Tennessee, Kentucky, et cetera, those four SEC teams in the top. If A and M wins that series this weekend against Georgia, I mean they're going to have to they're going to have to work their way out of a top eight. Like at this, at this point, they would be in a very very good shot for a top eight. 
it would be more of them having to work themselves out of one than someone taking a top eight for them. So I think that makes this weekend even bigger because I think that kind of solidifies the top eight going to postseason, which is kind of crazy to say when we're not even in the month of May. But, I mean, that's just kind of the way things are, are you know shaping up in college baseball right now. By the way, I'm looking at Kentucky. They're at South Carolina this weekend. Uh, then they host Arkansas. Um, they still have Florida. And they still have Vandy on their schedule, so uh, they may not be a lock for that. For that, they're going to earn it. Seed. If they win the SEC, they're going to earn it. No doubt about that. Hey, so some closing thoughts here on the Georgia series. You you like where A and M's trending? Um, just got to be careful, I guess, on on how they pitch to that potent lineup. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing for me. I think A and M's going to score runs again. I mean, what what you hope is that you know, uh, you know, conventional wisdom would suggest that A and M's probably going to score you know, six to nine to 10 runs a game. And with that, you know, if, if Condon's going to hit a bomb off of you with bases empty, go for it. But it, it, first pass is, is going to kind of be the name of the game this weekend. If a can eliminate that, uh, I don't see how Georgia wins that series this weekend. All right, Miss Callie Gardner, tell the people what they must do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, share, and tell all your friends about how awesome Texags Radio is. And I would say also tell them to text the show. Oh. Text the show <laughs> about how great certain personalities on this show. Don't you think? Specifically, Ethan Jones, like how, how good he is. Uh, they can do that. Yeah, they can do that. Believe it or not, I have not received a text about you yet. <laughs> Dang. That but hurts. I can scroll no. and I see one for Callie right now. <laughs> oh, God. We'll see you next time. <laughs>